my name's Matt, welcome back to the shop. And uh, last week I did a live stream, a quick live stream thingy just off the cuff because people were asking me, and then uh, about the Titan uh, submarine that disappeared, the submersible, this thing, the Ocean Gate uh, tube, the Ocean Gate tube of death, if you want to call it that. Um, a lot of people are interested in this, so I thought I'd do this video, and if you're not used to my videos or you haven't seen my videos before uh it's more of a conversational thing so i don't sit there and write a script i don't make this weird presentation thing uh i just like to get to the nitty gritty engineering of things but not only that is i kind of do it in a style where i'm talking to an individual so i'm imagining that i'm talking just to one person kind of thing any road to that end what i wanted to do is uh go through some of the technical and mechanical issues and um, the probable cause of why this you know actually died now this is hot press at the moment um which is it is what it is right what can you say there is a lot of nonsense been going around in all those two and i found that with my style of off the top of my head conversational style engagement videos whatever you want to call it um, that I wanted to focus in or use another video as a kicking off point. So if I try and sit here and just try and remember everything, I end up going off on tangents and this, that and the other, and there's not much of a structure to it. However, if we use somebody else's video, then it is um, easier to, you know, the subjects and the subject matter is brought up by somebody else. And then I will break down or add more or say that's right or that's wrong or blah, blah, blah. So this is 2-Bit Da Vinci. Uh, he's an engineer, he says, um, but I don't know what kind of engineer. For all I know, he could be a design engineer. And everyone knows that design engineers really aren't worth much. <laughs> that's a bit of a joke. Um, but yes, so it says... What we'll cover, 2-Bit Da Vinci, Coast Guard, Atlantic Ocean, Missing Submarine. These are obviously all of the what really happened taglines. We've all been glued to our TV sets, hoping and praying for the five souls aboard the Ocean Gate Titan uh, would come home safely after being lost at sea. But sadly, the wreckage was found. We know that it is not the case. This is a sad tragedy. Well, I'm sure all tragedies are sad. But so much about this story deserves a deeper look. As an engineer, I'm furious with some of the things that led up to this event. So today we'll let we'll break down on uh, what really happened and figure this out together, which he doesn't really do. And number two is he's got 13 million views. So this is what really happened. So I'm what I'm hoping from this video, and I, we don't really get it. Um, is that we're hoping that we find out what really happened. The other thing is there's another video here called The Titan Sub-Implosion Causes. We'll talk about stuff like that. Uh, since this guy's video has been released, this is why you don't bake early, you know what I mean? Uh, the parts have been recovered and we've seen the parts, so we'll talk about that. I've also got a, a pretty accurate uh, SolidWorks model um, that I've done a study on and you can see there that we have uh, the caps, the titanium caps, uh, this portal this, uh, on the end of it and all these dimensions are pretty much correct as the best I can make them. Also I want to add that um, Ocean Gate have removed some of the videos of the assembly and as soon as I found out that they had a website with the videos on, I downloaded them because I thought that um, it would very quickly be um, the be removed because you know people are using them as sources of information for how much of a mess up this was, and you know you you can't it is a bit it is a bit um, deleting stuff. I have a massive problem with you've made the video. The, the video of these people, one or two of the guys in the videos are dead, right? So it's a bit disrespectful. You're also trying to edit history, which really does annoy me. Any road, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this video and talk actually more about the points 
that he makes in it than anything else. Right, so let's crack on. Right then, so let's get on with this video. Um, on June 18th. I've, I've never seen this guy's videos before. He's got half a million subscribers. That's cool. I'm just making that, you know, making people aware of that. And uh, we'll go through. And be, the structure, because I am terrible at structure, I end up going off on tangents. So the structure is going to come from this video. 2023 Titan, a submersible operated by Ocean Gate, went missing in international waters in the North Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. The submersible was on a tourist expedition to view the wreckage of the RMS Titanic with five individuals on board, including the founder and CEO of OceanGate, Stockton Rush. Due to the estimated three days of oxygen supply, there was a huge rescue effort by the US Coast Guard and Canada's Coast Guard, which was unsuccessful. Until early on June 22nd, when evidence of the wreckage of the vessel started to emerge, leading to the tragic conclusion that the vessel imploded in the ocean depths and there were no survivors. As an so, there might be some people asking, how do you know that it imploded uh, at these pressures? <laughs> That's all that happens. You don't get leaks. If there is, it's almost like you can kind of think of it like an eggshell. If there's a tiny crack, right, that's it. It just goes. It's destroyed. It's done. So it is basically designed almost like an eggshell. If you actually look at the design, we'll go quickly back to SolidWorks. If you actually look at the design, it looks very much like a like a thermos flask. It looks very much like a you know. Now I haven't put all the hinges on and stuff. This front cap opens, so that's how you get in. There's hinges, stuff like that. There's mounting points. I just haven't bothered doing that kind of stuff. Uh, what I have done is. Uh, these are titanium. They're both the same titanium. It's just that I've done it so you can see. Uh, and we'll talk about the assembly as we go. But basically, it's a carbon fibre centre shaft. Just think of it, a cylinder. Just think of it like a toilet roll tube. Yeah. And then we've got titanium and uh, titanium attachment rings. And then we've got these end caps and this porthole and the hinges between this cap here and this ring here. So these end caps. These end caps are designed to um, attach something that is basically a reinforced plastic to a metal structure. Uh, I haven't put it in, but between here and here, there are bolt holes. So this is bolted to this. And when I say bolted, they put the crew in and then fasten it up. Right? There is no way to get out. Yeah, you have to have exterior help. Which, to be quite honest, when you're going down and down and down, there's no option for that anyway. So really, that isn't so much of a problem. The only problem is, is that if you come up, or there's a storm, or the ship sinks for some whatever reason, I don't know, maybe it's an iceberg, who knows, or pirates, or something. Something goes wrong with the crew up top, then these people in here automatically die. Right? There is no system to get out. Now... That isn't a failure with the design of this. It's a failure of the procedures of... Uh, or it's, a, it's a failure of basically the organisation of how this works. You don't have two crews, right? Up, you know, on the sea, on the sea surface, <laughs> uh, you should have two crews, right? Two independent crews. And um, then if one of them has a major problem, like they start to sink, then the other crew is there you know you it's basically redundancies right so with something like this and the amount of money that people spend to go down you'd want redundancies so the other little quick question is why why is this titanium why is this ring titanium why is this ring titanium why is this end cap titanium and why is this carbon fiber the reason why is because of mass right the more the heavier this is you think oh it sinks but when it has to come back up again you'll need to basically increase your buoyancy to a stupidly large degree and the basically the way it goes is that you've got air in here which makes this whole capsule buoyant but its mass is what pulls it down so what you do is you have ballast tanks and if i quickly have just like this little drawing here what you have is you'll have um tanks just 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 go with me like this and this thing should float, but only just. And then, when you want it to sink, and it'll float with the air in here, the air in here, and the air in here. Right? Now, 
what happens is, is that if you want to sink, oops, bloody hell. <laughs> if you want to sink, you put water in there and in there. Now, all of a sudden, this volume is, it's, it's water. It's, it's, it doesn't displace anything. So it'll sink, right? And then what you do is you pump that out. You have pumps that force that out. And then this is now air. So you have a greater volume that you're displacing. So you then float, right? It's how submarines work. They're called ballast tanks, right? Ballast in the same way as you use ballast for a hot air balloon, basically to give you lift and to make you, you know, descend, to make you fall. Um, now, if you make this incredibly heavy, and if you made this thing out of steel, um, to the, to withstand the pressures, if you made this thing to steel, what would happen is, is that you uh, would need huge amounts of volume to have ballast tanks, and it makes it unwieldy, right? Which is, you know, again, which is fair enough. So what you do is you try and make this thing lighter. And that's what they did. And they decided to go with carbon fiber. And unfortunately, that was a mistake, which we'll get to. Um, but any road, let's carry on with the video. So we've got a bit of a breakdown of why you'd want it to be carbon fiber. Engineer, I'm furious about what happened and the different shortcuts that were taken. We'll go through all of that today. So let's try to figure out what exactly what happened and what we can learn from this. I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci. Let's start with what we know about the company operating the Titan Submersible. OceanGate Incorporated is a privately held U.S. company operating out of Everett, Washington, that provides crewed submersibles for tourism industry and research and exploration. The company was founded in 2009 by Stockton Rush and Guillermo Solin. Stockton Rush wanted to be an astronaut, so he got his commercial pilot license. But because of bad eyesight, he could never be a military pilot. So instead, he moved... This just makes it a bit of a beginning, middle and end story for a video. I don't think it really matters. I thought we were... this is what really happened. So if this is what really happened and you've only got 21 minutes, I think that you're wasting time here a bit from San Francisco to Seattle to work at McDonnell Douglas as a flight test engineer for the F-15 Eagle. After attending the launch of Spaceship One in the Mojave Desert in 2004, he decided he didn't want to... Now, the weirdest thing is the guy was a flight test engineer, so he fully understands testing. Right? He understands why you do it. He understands it from a military point of view, which they're, they're very tight. Uh, tolerances, very tight spec specifications. So, and and they, you know, they understand um, basically putting their uh, technology and their machinery under extreme loads. So, it's strange that that is the one interesting bit that this guy seems to have negated a lot of that and just have just gone with it. I go up to space as a tourist. He wanted to be like Captain Kirk on the Enterprise. He wanted to explore and pivoted his pursuit to undersea exploration. I don't know where he gets the Captain Kirk thing unless it's a quote of his, which if it was, you'd like him to put that in. It just seems like a bit of embellishment that I, I, we're here for what really happened, not for fantasy ideas that you think happened. Unless there is sources for this, but then surely you'd include them. He was married to Wendy Rush, a descendant of Isidore and Ida Strauss, two people who actually passed away on the sinking of the Titanic, which ties into the story here today. I don't know. Maybe my pet, my great, great, great grandparents died on the Titanic. Oh, therefore I want to explore the Titanic. It might have given him the idea. It just seems a bit whatever. The tragic events happened during a deep sea tourism expedition to explore the wreckage of the Titanic, which sunk in the northern Atlantic in 1912. Now, very quickly here, I will add in something else. There's nothing to do with this video. Some people have been saying there's enough footage and video of the Titanic. Why would anyone want to go down there? That's like saying enough people have had sex. Why bother? Enough people have got kids. Why bother? Enough people have ridden around that racetrack. So why am I doing it? The people who say that seem to be i don't know they i'd imagine they come from the ideal that actually experiencing things are, are just not worth it there are risks people take risks it happens all the time i don't see what the problem is with that before we get into the specifics of this particular tragedy let's put just how difficult deep sea exploration is into context 
It's easy to be in awe of aviation and space exploration because breaking free of gravity and flying through the air seem like such a feat. But in many ways, deep sea craft are the much greater engineering challenge. I disagree. I completely disagree. The fact of the matter is, is here's a couple of clowns who have made a submersible. Um, and, and the thing is, it, it's been successful. Right, so if they used it twice and then binned it and built another one and then kept on re repeating that cycle, there probably wouldn't be really that. There probably wouldn't have been a disaster. James Cameron had this thing built by a small company, and they just do that. Now, <laughs> space flight is easy, is basically saying is less of an engineering feat. I'd like to see the company that built James Cameron's um, Deep Challenger Explorer, whatever it's called, or Ta Ocean Gate get into space and get into space is much more difficult i don't know why people think it's not it's such a strange thing to say now the craft this is the thing the actual physical craft might not be as under much as much um stress so what it doesn't matter but it all comes down to pressure for in a, for for example the first submersibles were made long before anyone went into space we don't think about air pressure because at sea level, it's just 14.7 pounds per square inch. That pressure is the result of the column of air that reaches above us all the way into outer space. Now, I, I don't like this idea, right? This idea is, is a bit nonsense. So um, we'll have to do a bit of paintbrush again. So this whole idea, right, that there is a column of air from space on top of your head, and that's what causes the pressure you experience. It's nonsense. What... <laughs> Because the air pressure against us is in all directions. So if that was true, right, you know, you're, you're stood here like a little bloke or a woman, whatever, or the other ones, you know, the, the other kind. Uh, if you're stood here like this, air pressure is hitting you all from all directions. What happens is, is, is because of all of that atmosphere, um, the pressure increases. So in a sense... If molecules were as big as your head, right, it's because of these molecules above that apply a force, you know, because they're all bouncing around, but they apply a force generally downwards due to the acceleration of gravity. And then this molecule hits you in the face, and it has this pressure because of all this stuff on top. This whole idea that you're walking around with all these atoms stacked upon your head, it... it it's just a childish it, it's it's a childish notion and it yeah the reason why that's a problem is because the reason why i pull that up and say it's a childish exp explanation is okay then so this thing only has to have strength vertically right it doesn't matter about the sides which is complete nonsense it has to be you know it's like a table right a table um Oh, a table. I'm trying to think of a better example. You could have a ring, right? You could have like a a, a ring, a ring, and it's strong vertically, but in the sides, it's just open. Doesn't matter. You don't. You could just use paper. No, pressures from every single direction, and it's because of all of the water in the ocean. Full stop. Right? It's an acceleration of gravity. But this idea, this column, I hate that idea. All those very molecules above us pushing down result in that pressure. But water is a much more dense fluid than air. So for every 10 meters or 32.8 feet you dive, the pressure increases by one atmosphere or 14.7 PSI. The Titanic is sitting on the ocean floor at about 12,500 feet below sea level. The I do like that picture, that was a brilliant. I, lo I do like that. That must have taken ages to have that edit like that. The two broken parts of the ship, the bow and the stern, are more than 2,600 feet apart and surrounded by debris after... What did that say? It said at the bottom. The ship, the bow and the stern, are more than 2,600 feet apart. It says remove poster here. <laughs> and surrounded by debris after over 100 years of being the bottom of the ocean. The wreckage is... Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm missing stuff. I was too much laughing at that. And surrounded by debris after over 100 years of being the bottom of the ocean. The wreckage is 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. You can see here. Let's put this depth into perspective. Imagine laying on your back with a one foot by one foot board, okay? And how much weight you'd feel on that board. At 100 meters, the size of a soccer or football field, we have the pressure of 10 atmospheres. Now remember, we're, we're getting into 
uh, we're coming up to 20% of this video and we are not we haven't done anything yet we haven't really explained we're explaining the very basics where all these graphics and stuff are all nice and all the rest of it but we're here for what really happened um you could just say the pressure down there is extreme it's 380 atmospheres job done instead of doing this 140 actually we'll skip this because like i say it's just a lot of a lot of nonsense it's not nonsense it's all factually correct it's just Pressures are 376 atmospheres. That one by one foot board on our chest would have the weight of 797,000 pounds. The Ocean Gate Titan was rated for a mass dive depth of about 4,000 meters. Now that might sound insane, but actually it's not even the record for the deepest human beings have been. That honor. Go See, this, it, 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 we're here for what really happened and we're talking about history and other things. Goes to James Cameron. And the Deep Sea Challenger built in Australia in 2012. The Deep Sea Challenger reached the deepest part of the Mariana Trench in... <laughs> I like that. I do like this bit. It's almost like you go down that far in that torpedo-looking thing and you find James Cameron. He is at 11,000 metres. The Pacific... That's where he lives. That's why he filmed the abyss. ...ocean, the deepest point on Earth, at a mind-boggling 11,000 metres or 36,000 feet. Here, we'd feel 1,090 atmospheres of pressure, and that one by one foot board would have the weight of 2.3 million pounds on it. Compare that to the difference in pressure of an airplane at cruising altitude of 36,000 feet, where outside the pressure might be 3 psi, and on the inside, between 10 and 12. And that hopefully puts in perspective why more people have been to space than have been into the deepest parts of our oceans. Now well, no, no, that's not the perspective. The reason why most pe more people have been into space is because space is uh the beginning of a journey right when you go to the bottom of the ocean that's the that's the end that's that's it that's the end and there's nothing there this is the thing there's nothing there to do there's you know there's a few things to discover which you could do robotically and we do space robotically the fact of the matter is is that space <laughs> there's other planets there's other galaxies universe in the entire universe it's the beginning of a journey. There are places to go. At the bottom of the ocean, there's nowhere to go. It's That's it. It'd be like, um, you know, well, you've been to the North Pole, but have you been further? It's like, well, if I go further, I come down the other side and I'm where people already are. The North Pole is a singularity. That is the end. As soon as you get to there, then you are coming back, if you get what I mean. Now let's talk about the red flags that plagued Oceangate from the get-go. Right, here we go. So we're, we're five minutes into the video. We're beyond 20% of this video, and we're actually getting there. By the way, Oceangate just sounds like a walking scandal ready to happen. That's not... <laughs> so one, it's not... It, <laughs> that's not a point, right? You could call it, I don't know, the world's greatest submersible experience dot com. It doesn't matter. Or, I don't know make you go missing.com or something it doesn't matter it's, it's someone's name that they've chosen it's a gate to the ocean right this is how you enter the ocean i, I get where the name comes from it sounds silly but it's american and american things a lot of the times do sound silly i don't know why you're um not basically convinced by that first the design limitations of the Titan required that the hatch be bolted down by 17 to 18 bolts from the outside was it 17 or 18 side it looks like 18 to me. This means there's no way for the passengers inside to open the hatch. Now, I, I, we've kind of been through this, but we'll let him go. They'd have to rely on ground crews to open it. Now, this is understandable because... Of the Would you call it ground crew? I thought you'd call it, like, the surface crew. These deep sea vessels have to be incredibly tight. They have to be very strong. The water seals have to hold. And that's all complicated. But I think that... Right, so the water seals have to hold. That's wrong. There are no water seals. There are no O-rings. It's not like that. This thing is actually... And this is what a lot of people... Um, I've seen a lot of people talk about these things. Is They don't understand that... It, it, the, the thing has actually been forced together. And you can actually use that to... Um, actually build... A, you, you can use the forces of the pressure to actually make it stronger, in a sense. What's the word? You can use the forces to actually increase the strength of the craft, right? So, for instance, you could have, um, you know, just say, well, we're going to go paint again. 
because it's easier. Uh, just say you've got two flanges, right? So you've got a flange like this, right? And what we do is when we have fittings, right? We, um, you know, we try and bolt these two things together. And what we're doing in the, in essence is we are getting these two things and we're clamping them. We're using force of a fastener to clamp these two things together, like a vice. Well, the pressure acting on the outside will actually force these flanges together. The problem is, is that will the forces cause this to crack and shear off if there's any discrepancies or whatever? You know what I mean? So you can actually use pressure to force these things together. You can actually make use of the pressure. This shows you why it's really important to have backup systems and have some sort of... An and, with, and with stuff like this at these pressures, it's not... Oh, keep the water out. Well, it is ultimately, but it's not about you know sinking, getting wet. It, these things are catastrophic. That's why the word implosion has been banded around. It is literally the reverse direction of an explosion. So, in a sense, you can think of it as an explosion, right? Actually, probably that's the best way to think about it. Think about this whole thing as when this fails, it explodes like it has some HG in it, right? Like it's a hand grenade but it's just internally instead of externally. That's all it is, just the, the, the forces are you know, the wrong way around. But we're talking about um, when things fail, things happen at the speed of sound, and they happen at the speed of sound in water, which is a lot higher than it is uh, in air. Explosive detonation cord you can pull to blow the hatch in the event that the craft surfaced and no one found it and that was actually one of the fears early on is that the vessel could actually surface and be at the surface somewhere along the atlantic unfound and still die from sub they actually found uh that, sorry they found there was a guy who had been on the ocean gate titan and said that they came to the surface and the uh surface crew couldn't find them and they could text them and talk to them, but they didn't know where they were because they had no GPS on the Titan. Now, all of this is all about basically poor operational um, organisation. And it's just just bad ideas and people not using common sense. But uh, the guy was said, you know, was stuck in it for about four to five hours waiting for the crew to turn up. On the surface, bobbing around, you know, safe. They just couldn't get out because they couldn't open the hatch and the air could run out. The Titan also didn't have GPS or other navigational... Oh, no, he's, he's going to mention it, which is stupid. I don't know why you'd have this kind of system. ...instruments on board. And it didn't have a locator beacon either, like a black box. On you see, these kind of things... Um, having the crew be able to find you quickly, having a GPS system, having a buoy, having anything like that is... Uh, wouldn't have helped in this circumstance. So we're talking about what really happened. Um, speculating about, well, if this hadn't happened, some other type of disaster might have. Eh, you could say that about anything. Yeah, they landed on the boom, but it could have gone terribly wrong and maybe the rockets collided and maybe this and maybe that and maybe and maybe and maybe. You can speculate forever, right? You could say, well, look at Apollo 13 versus Apollo 11. That could have happened, etc., etc., etc. It's one of those things where if you sit there and say, well, this could have happened, this could have happened, and this could have happened, you can sit here all week, and then you can't then compare it to things uh, that haven't happened to, you know, you, like, we can't talk about that, about Apollo 11, it was successful. The fact of the matter is, is we want to talk about what really happened, not what you think might happen, or what might have been a problem. Now, highlighting some of these points might be, well, as you can see, the company was a bit you know, running a bit of a shit way. But we could go back and look at Apollo 11, and they made mistakes, right? They, they, I, I know of a few where they did this, and then, do you know what? Um, it's like, for example, Alan Shepard. Uh, they nearly had a cold weld on the door uh, for the Mercury capsule. So basically where the metal is so close together that it welded the door and it couldn't get back in, right? So they they, they made changes, right? It didn't actually result in massive problems or failures, but they say, right, that was that didn't <laughs> that was close. Let's you know, let's let's change that. So these could all be lessons learned without a major disaster, but that's not what's happened. What really happened is that there's been a major disaster, and it'd be nice if we actually got to it. An aircraft, 
Most subs use GPS for near surface navigation, which doesn't work in deeper waters. In deeper waters, they use dead reckoning course information obtained by the ship's gyro compass, measured speed, and estimates of local ocean currents. They well, they could use accelerometers as well. I don't know why there isn't a very basic tether, like a cable. They also rely on inertial navigation systems, which is an estimated position source utilizing acceleration, deceleration, yeah, accelerometers, pitch and roll from the computers that transmit this data. The Titan, in contrast, appeared to rely only on data provided by the surface support vessel. In 2019, OceanGate published a blog post explaining why the Titan... See, this video has now disappeared, but luckily I got them all. <laughs> ...was not certified by any ship authority, which is a huge red flag. OceanGate stated, the vast majority of marine and aviation accidents are actually the result of operator error, not mechanical failure. So, right, so we're talking about OceanGate now, the actual quote. Um, what a lot of shite, right? I'm sorry, but that's just a little rubbish. Um, I don't care if the vast majority, it's the minority. It, what that statement says is that mechanical failures do happen. Who cares about the conglomerate? Who cares about the average? Who cares about that? It's like this, right? It's like um, people say, oh, what's the point in entering the lottery? You've got 14.7 million chance of winning. But if you win, you've got a one out of one chance because you won. That's it. It, it's not, the argument just doesn't hold water. <laughs> and argue that classification focused solely on the physical state of the vessel and not the corporate actions, which are characterized as a constant... Com so, and argue that classification focused solely on the physical state of the vessel and not its corporate action, which is characterized as a constant... What? ...committed effort and a focused corporate culture of maintaining high-level operational safety. Right, well, this I hope this is the, the CEO who disappeared because, um, and I've seen other things that he said, and the guys, to say these come from the F-15 program as a test engineer, this guy is lying, he's lying, and he knows he's lying, right? So basically what he's saying, argue that classification follows so because... Uh, classification focused solely on the physical state of the vessel. Well, yes, it's mechanical testing and not its corporate actions, which it characterizes a constant committed effort and a focused corporate culture. Forget the cultures, right? The ocean doesn't care about the culture of any corporate entity. It doesn't care, right? It, it, what it cares about is the physics, and you should know this, and you do know this, so he's a liar. Do you know what? The best thing that ever happened to this guy was that he died that he died at the bottom of the ocean because if this had all failed after the some of the things that he said he'd end up topping himself anyway because the guilt and the shame would be overbearing right it is sad that these things happen but i can't change that so we're, we're talking you know we could sit here and analyze uh well hitler did this and goebbels did this and blah 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 and nasty people and blah so when people fuck up and they are ironically so um, full of themselves because the, this guy, this uh, Rush guy, who's the CEO, some of the shit he said, like, um, oh, well, you're just trying to pander to an authority and you're not thinking outside of the box. Some of the stuff he said, the irony, and the irony that he died at a place where people were um, full of themselves, right? They weren't humble at all. They are like, this ship is unsinkable. It can take it. Forget the icebergs. It's fine. We'll be all... We don't need lifeboats. And all of the other things. I'm going for my break. Blah, 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 blah. All this kind of rubbish. It's not sinking. It's fine. All this kind of thing. The irony. And the lessons that should be learned from Titanic. Uh, and this is why the story is told. This is why it's shared. The lesson is... Do not underestimate the physical world. Right? Respect things that are dangerous. These things, you know... Iceberg warnings, keeping someone on the radio 24-7, all of these things are there for a reason. And if you mess around with fire and you get burned, you know, shit happens, right? So the fact that this guy is running a company that is going down to the Titanic and say, look at the Titanic. The reason why we're down here this deep and the reason why it's so dangerous is because people were full of themselves and here we are being full of ourselves the lesson hasn't been learned 
And I think the Titan, uh, the Ocean Gate Titan scenario will be remembered just as much as the Titanic. I really do, and I really hope it does, because if anything, the Titan disaster is more important than the Titanic disaster, because it is, we, we, we did something, we were full of ourselves, and we need to learn from it. But we didn't, right? So, you know, it's twice, what is it? Twice, once bitten, twice shy kind of thing. And we weren't, right? It's fool me once, that kind of thing. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And it, it's definitely that. So it it just shows you that the rest of the, the universe doesn't care. That sounds like absolute b to me. I'm sorry. Journalist David yes, it does, yeah. Prog, who rode on the Titan to view the Titanic in 2022, noted during his expedition, the surface support vessel lost track of the... Ah, this is probably where I got this from, actually. I'm, I'm repeating things that have already been said. Titan for about four to... Which is, I do apologize. ...five hours, and mentioned that adding a locator beacon was actually discussed during this event. They could still send short text to the sub, but they had no idea where it was. I don't know why you do that. Why would you do that? You can easily... Everyone knows you can easily drift off course. That these currents can take you. I think what the problem is, is that all of these people... A lot of these people that did this Ocean Gate stuff weren't actually, you know, mariners, submariners, or even sailors. I think that, you know, if you rent a guy out who, who you know, who is a sailor, who takes his boat out, he's not in charge. You know what I mean? So he's, when he says to him. How, how, so you know where, where's the transponder? It's like what transponder? It's like well, how do you how are you going to find the sub? And it's like well, it'll come up here. What? It's like no, and he just rolls his eyes and goes fuck you. you know? Well, I'm glad I'm getting paid. You know what I mean, kind of thing. It, this is what happens when people just have money. They don't have the experience and the you know you're not going to gain the experience. What you do is you pay people who do know. It was quiet and very tense, he says. And they shut off the ship's internet to keep us from tweeting. It's weird that, though. How do they, they get internet out there? 400 miles out? Well, actually, these are super rich people, so they probably have, you know, bloody geostationary inter space internet, probably. Oh, my God, that is terrifying. And they've already known that this could happen. But that's not what the failure was. So, yes, it might... I don't know about terrifying... It's a bit of a worry, you know what I mean, that they have no way to get out. But it sounds like they do have a hell of a lot of air. And if I'm sure that if they couldn't find them, they would contact the Coast Guard really quickly. I don't think people are going to die because they're stuck in that. I, it could happen. Anything's possible. It could literally take off and fly to the moon. But what I'm saying is, is it's a lot of you're bigging this up a lot. The craft was also controlled by a video game controller, which sounds like some cool Silicon Valley way of thinking, beanbag chairs and break rooms, but it's downright stupid. No, it's not. Aha! Right. So, do you know who uses PlayStation and Xbox controls? It's funny that he says that. Xbox Control US Army. The US Army use controls for, well, all sorts. Look at this. US Navy submarines are getting 360 controllers to control their periscopes. Oh my god. So basically, the guy, these guys spend their time underwater are using 360 controls. So this is what actually makes me think. When I heard this, I was like, what are you talking about? Right? They fly, they fly drones with PlayStation and Xbox controls. Right? It says video game controls on subs are normal. This is the thing, right? It, it, they do it all the time. There's videos. Look at this. US state, US, United States Navy to use export controls in their new submarines. This is 2017. This is normal. Now, this is what is weird. Oh, there you go. The, the US uses drones with Xbox controls. Right, so what happens is is that a control pad is just a button input. So you can have some extremely sexy custom-made thing, or you can have something that, one, your troops know how to hold, know how to use because they've been playing games most of their lives before they even signed up, 
but it's all done for you. It's done. It's there. It's in a package. And you can go and buy it. It costs nothing. It won't take long for a tech to wire that up properly, right, at all, to make a custom adapter. This is normal. This is normal throughout um, all industries, actually, that people are starting to just take off-the-shelf equipment to do other things. So him saying this is one very short-minded, well, not short-minded, it's very naive of him to say this, um, that they use a, a control pad. That's absolutely normal. Because this is the thing. All right, so what what would you want them to use? Uh, two joysticks? Where did they get the joysticks from? Do you think they're going to make their own, or do you think they've just gone out of PC World and picked some up? Well, they'll just do that. So you've got two fighter control joysticks. Oh, well, these are based on military fighter jets. Ah, well, that would be cool, you see, because it's not childish and stupid. So it, it, at the end of the day, they are buttons and it's ergonomics. Someone spent a long time making these control pads. Why do something? Why reinvent the wheel? terrifying and they've already known that this could happen. The craft was also controlled by a video game controller which sounds like some cool Silicon Valley way of thinking, beanbag chairs and break rooms, but it's downright stupid. It's not stupid. I'm sorry dude but you're stupid. I'm surprised you don't know this. Military spec products go through incredible Oh! Ho, ho, ho. Egg on face. Rigorous testing making them safe in all operating environments. For right, so what's what's military got to do with the thing? Number two is, you are inside a tube. These guys have their phones with them. They have GoPro, GoPro cameras. You're inside with your jeans on and your sandals. Why do you think that you can't have a control pad? <clears throat> what has military testing got to do with anything? And on top of all that, the US Navy use control pads to control things. And this was back in 2017. You look like a bit of an idiot. For example, as expensive as Apple's Vision Pro headset is at $3,500, it is downright cheap compared to the $400,000 that it costs to get a helmet for the F-35 fighter jet. But that F-35 fighter jet helmet is uh, extremely advanced, and it was extremely advanced for the time. They made these helmets a long time ago. The TAD system and the spyglass that they used in the Apache, that was made in the 1980s when things cost a hell of a lot. Where was Apple's glass, spy glass, headset thing then? It didn't exist. And the reason why, well, lower volumes, of course, but also... Well, it's not just that. Is The fact of the matter is, is that thing's covered in accelerometers. And like I say, eventually they will change these things for these things. But this is a helmet as well, right? That's the other thing. Is This actually has to protect your head. It's got the oxygen feeds. And it's got a, an integration between the aircraft and his actual head because they have to go through unbelievable vibration testings to make sure the welds will all hold up, make sure that the higher levels of radiation... They just say welds. ...believable vibration testings to make sure the welds will all hold up. The welds on a helmet that's made out of carbon fiber. Funnily enough, carbon fiber. <laughs> ...make sure that the higher levels of radiation at 40 to 50,000 feet won't do any damage long term, and to make sure absolute reliability. Now let's talk... Absolute reliability, yes. Talk about how we got to the Titan. Still, what was what was the helmet, right? What was the target acquisition helmet got to do with a remote control of a submersible? I really don't understand. You can actually go back to James Cameron's video, uh, film the video, the <laughs> film the abyss. They've got joysticks, and where do you think they got those joysticks from? Either off aircraft or from the gaming sector. I don't understand why that's not a thing. I'm, I'm actually quite. What the hell are you talking about? Oceangate started by purchasing Antipodes, which is a... Which looks exactly like it's out of the abyss. ...immersible back in 2012, which was their first test bed for testing, and... It's not testing, it's been built. They just bought it and went, this is cool, we can make money out of this. And then let's go bigger, let's go... What's the ultimate prize? Oh, the ultimate prize will be the Titanic. Learning about this entire endeavor. Next, they built... Cyclops 1, which is in collaboration with University of Washington's Applied Physics Laboratory. And this was a deeper sea vessel capable of reaching a max depth of 500 meters. Still, which is basically like most submarines, uh, military submarines. Nowhere near deep enough for the Titanic, but this was their next step. That's the next step up, isn't it? 
and their next iteration. In the early design, the hull was made of carbon fiber and the whole submersible would dive vertically with pivoting seats to ensure the passengers remained upright. Now, it was said that Boeing worked with OceanGate and the University of Washington on their initial design analysis, but we'll get back to that in a second because there's a little bit more to that story. Finally, they would arrive at the Titan. This guy sounds like a journalist. It doesn't sound like an engineer. I don't know. What, he, what did you do engineering in? Their final product that would actually be rated for 4,000 meters. We're still on history, by the way. There was still a history of the Titan, and we are coming up to halfway through the video, and we haven't found out what really happened. One of the key takeaways about the Titan is that this is a carbon fiber and titanium hold submersible. Now, this is really exotic in the world of materials. We've been What the hell does that mean? Exotic. Using high-strength steel and aluminum for a long time, and we have data, engineering data on how they fail and what to look for and test methodologies. But carbon fiber is still quite exotic. No, no, right. So I'm, I'm sorry, but you must be a design engineer. If, if you're an engineer at all, because what you just said then is rubbish. The problem with carbon fiber isn't the fact that we don't have tech. It's easy. How do you get test data on carbon fiber? You test it loads. And now I have just, I've gone self-employed recently, but I've just left uh, SGS, which is a testing um, engineering firm, right? That's where I used to work. And what I did was test materials. In fact, any car you've ever driven probably doesn't have much carbon fiber in it. What has that got to do with anything? This is an underwater submersible. Well, all submersibles are underwater. <laughs> or they, they operate underwater. Uh, what the hell has that got to do with anything? Right? My kettle doesn't have any carbon fiber in it. So what? And my kettle is cylindrical and it holds water. The only exceptions are really, really high-end supercars. Or even in the case of aviation, more recently with the Boeing Dreamliner. But before that, we've always used aluminum and titanium and other materials like that. So just- you mean, you mean metals and not composites. I'm seriously doubting this guy's credentials and abilities to even do a video like this. For the simple fact is, it's just terminology. Just generally, there's less known about it. And it's also really- What's this say? Ocean Gate signed a contract with Spencer Composites, the carbon composite cylinder. So, if you're going to, <laughs> if you are going to highlight something, why? Spencer previously had built the composite pressure hull for a single person deep flight challenger for Steve Fawcett, who had designed by Graham Hawks. After Fawcett died, what did he die of? Deep flight challenger was acquired by Richard Branson's Virgin. Uh, Virgin they announced plans to conduct a series of five dives to the deepest point of the oceans. Refused to endorse the plan as the craft had been designed to dive only once. Because we do not understand, or it is almost impossible to predict, the cyclic fatigue rates of carbon fibre. Because every single one will be different. You would have to test them to destruction. And once you test them to destruction, to failure, you go, ah, that's what its failure rate was. It could only have done eight dives. But you've destroyed it. And that's the only thing. The predictability of the fatigue rate of carbon fibre is random. That's the problem. It's really difficult to make sure that you get it right. OceanGate signed a contract with Spencer Composites in January 2017 for the carbon composite cylinder. So it says that. Ocean Gate's calculations show that the cylinder that formed the centre section of the crew compartment should have a wall thickness of 100 and, uh, 114 millimetres, which they rounded up to 127. It consisted of 480 alternating, uh, alternate, alternating layers of pre-preg. So pre-preg basically means it is carbon fibre with the resin already in it. So they pre-soak they pre -soak the resin that has to be activated when you heat it up. It's unidirectional cloth laid in the axial direction, the wet wound filament laid in a looping direction. The cylinder was built in 2017 and cured at 137 degrees for seven days. The entire pressure vessel consists of two titanium hemispheres, two matching titanium interface rings, and 142 internal diameter and 2.4 meters long carbon fiber wound cylinder, the largest such device ever built for a use for a crude submersible. One of the titanium hemispherical 
end caps was fitted with a 380mm diameter acrylic window. In addition to the crew compartment, it included a landing skid structure and outer glass fibre composite shell, both bolted to the titanium interface ring. The weirdest thing was, is that the interface, everything's everything's bolted to the interface rings, so I'll just point out what they are. So the interface rings are these darker bands, this one and this one. And these two are glued, right? They are glued to uh, this. They're glued to the carbon fiber ring. Uniform and small. So these videos have gone missing, but this is the carbon fiber cylinder. And this is them literally pasting on glue. There's the ring. It's got a lip on the inside. And they're going to glue it to it. So on this model, we have exactly that. So we have a cylinder here like that with this glued into here. Now I've put a bit of wiggle room in there on purpose. Um, it's just for collision reasons when this actually starts to flex because I actually wanted to simulate actually a property of what would, would actually happen. Um, but yeah, basically so these bits are bolted together these bits are bolted together but these bits are just sandwiched together and there's actually a depression in here to give you a bit of a surface there and the pressure applied that squeezes this cylinder um it's actually squeezes pretty much everywhere because obviously if it squeezes on the hemisphere like this it's then pushing towards the center so like i say you can actually use the pressure to help this is the point of maintain the stability and not maintain the stability maintain the structure like an egg almost yeah. but that's literally it now the oh, yeah. distance well, that will be the pressure vessel for cyclops too it'll go to 4000 meters it looks like it's basically like inch masking tape so that's the in, that's the overlap there the interference is an inch Here's, be the deepest diving carbon fiber you can see the holes right. oops you can see the holes there and that's how it mounts to the rest of it so that's what it all looks like, uh, and that's basically what this is. So the, it contains blah blah blah, blah. Um, both bolted to the titanium. Overall, the tight the titan was blah 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 and weighed just under 10, 10 tons with a maximum payload of what is it? It moved about three blah blah blah. It keeps on going on and on and on. This was the same company that built the composite pressure hole for the single. Right. So there's there's something else that's, that's said composite cylinder this was the same company that built the composite so it says the titan was equipped with a real-time acoustic monitoring system which ocean gate claimed would detect an onset of buckling in the carbon fiber hull prior to catastrophic failure you do realize that that time is nothing it's buckling it's gone so i reckon they're talking shite there i reckon they're making that up because that <laughs> that wouldn't help you whatsoever what you'd need is strain gauges and even then it's too late. Pressure hole for the single person Deep Flight Challenger for Steve Fawcett. After Fawcett passed away, Deep Flight Challenger was acquired by Richard Branson's Virgin Oceanic. So basically this guy's just reading Wikipedia, just like I have. Which had announced plans to conduct a series of five dives to the deepest points of the ocean. But Deep Flight refused to endorse the plan as the craft had been designed to dive only once. This is important. We'll get back to this in a second. I hope you do. In a statement, they said the problem is the strength of the deep flight challenger does decrease after each dive. It's called fatigue. I'm surprised you didn't use that word. It's strongest on the first dive, said Adam Wright, the firm's president. It was designed to set the record, dive to the deeps, and then be retired as an exhibit in the Smithsonian. I hope it looks like that. Jesus Christ, that would be really funny. This is a really crucial part because sometimes in engineering, what it comes down to is the operational lifetime and understanding it. This might have been at play here. Mm, operational lifetime isn't exactly the same as fatigue limits and cyclic rates. Basically, how many times you can put, how many times you can apply a force to something, and how it how the strain responds to that. So it's like um, think about it like this: you could have a, a a hammer and a nail, right? And you hit a nail into a hammer. Great job, right? Um, but imagine that it's a really tough material. What's going to happen is you keep on hammering and hammering and hammering, and eventually 
that nail is going to start to buckle, right? It's not going in and it's going to start to buckle. So each initial force isn't enough to buckle it on its own, but the repeated strikes, right? It just slightly dislocates the, the atomic structure, just slightly changes it, slightly changes it, slightly changes it, and then it starts to bend, and as it gets bent, then it really loses its ability to maintain its shape and transfer the forces, so it starts to buckle, and then it's it's done, it's knackered, right, it bends. And by the way... Or another way you can think about it, it's like when you get a paper clip, right, if you bend it one way and bend it the other, and you're plastically deforming it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, the atoms are going to, and the grain structure is going to bend in a particular way. You bend it one way, and then when you bend it back, um, it's almost like Lego where it's got, it's got, it hasn't got many options to move, and one or two of them options now are going to be, all right, let's go, right? It lets go a, a couple of bricks, just say. So it's almost like it can bend one way, but when you try and bend it the other way, repeatedly backwards and forwards, you start to snap some of these connections if you want to put, it starts to tear, it starts to pull apart. I try to go to and this is just basically just internal damage, right? So a lot of the times this is a problem. You can't see this happening because it's all at an atomic atomic scale. You can see this happening if you halt proceedings, do cross sections, X rays, stuff like that. You can start to see it happen, but we're talking in operation. So what we do is is that we get a material and or it can even be a component and we can do cyclic testing on it so basically we apply this load repeatedly repeatedly again and again and again and again and again and again a good example is i used to work with someone who used to work for whirlpool and they again they put bricks in washing machines and just keep on testing them to see what fails first right uh bricks covered in like a rubber coating but basically really heavy and it's an off center mass so they chuck these bricks in, and then around and around and around it goes. It doesn't physically damage the drum. Well, they hope it doesn't. But they go to see what fails first, right? So you are, uh, you know, you, you're destructive testing. And what you're doing is, is you then say, ah, with this extreme loading, this managed to do a 1,000 washes before it started to die. And the thing that died was this and then this. And we go, hmm, that's acceptable. Or no, that's not acceptable. That shouldn't happen, right? So when they do that, they have some kind of predictability through testing. Now, if your materials um, produce repeatable results like this, you can then say, ah, the the uh, failure rate of this material is N, right? Which means how many cycles, right? At whatever stress and strain. So then you can you can basically, you know, you can publish tables and say this material will do that. And this is why we have standards, right? We have material standards. We'll have a 1030 or a 5251 or we'll have a, you know, a 6160. We give all these specifications to if you cook this metal to this recipe, you know what I mean? So a bit of manganese, a bit of aluminium, a bit of this and these percentages, right? And then you heat treat it like this, right? then we we are confident that this will perform to this. Uh, you know, it can resist these forces, All right? And then you can plug in your uh, percentages. So I want to stay well away from that. I want a factor of safety of five, and I want it only to, you know, 10% of its, 10 or 15, 20% of its yield, right? Great. And then we know how many cycles we can do with it. Fantastic. And they do this with stuff like Conrods. So they do this with all sorts of, you know, engine um, engine components, right? They know what they will fail at. Now, one of the problems with carbon fiber is is that when you do this same kind of testing, you get these massive outliers where instead of the last one did fifty thousand cycles, this one did a thousand one thousand five hundred cycles. This one did twenty six thousand cycles. That's the problem, right? And it's because when you uh, forge a metal, right? You put this volume of steel in, you heat it up, and then you squish it with this amount of pressure, right? You can then say, well, it's this volume, it's this mass, we've done these kind of heat treats and all the rest of it to it. We are confident that that does that. When you're laying stuff up and gluing it, it is literally paper mache. Now, as a material, how good is this paper mache? Don't know. It'd be... It'd be Carbon fibre is a stronger version of chipboard, right? You think about chipboard or wood, right? The yield strength of wood is <laughs> all over the place, right? 
it's random, basically, right? And you can find out what it is for that particular piece of wood by breaking it. And then you go, right, we know that that piece of wood was this strong. You take another plank from the same tree, another part of the tree, it's all over the place. The fact of the matter is, is that there is not a pr manufacturing process that is certified, right? There is no one is building cylinders of carbon fibre and saying this can survive this for this many cycles. Because if you did, if you said we can guarantee that this cylinder can take a hundred cycles of this, you know, this kind of stress, right? Cool. And then we say, well, we only do, we'll only do it to fifty. Then you'd be fine. And then it wouldn't. There could be other failures. And there's always, you know, you can always have imperfections. You can always have problems. Like Ferrari. Ferrari still, uh, they sand cast their blocks, right? And they still x-ray them, right? They x-ray them looking for voids and cavities and inclusions and just bits where it's wrong, where it's thin, where it's this, that, and the other. Where there's voids, maybe there's a big hydrogen gas pocket or something, right? Maybe some of the cores crumbled apart and that bit's gone really thick or thin or whatever. They still x-ray them because they're about to spend loads of money machining them. And... Uh, you know, and and they have this. It get it early, so if it is wrong, we can quickly cast some more. Um, you know what I mean. So they're doing quality control like that. But again, they can test these things and look for problems. You can send off samples of testing. Literally, we used to receive SGS. They we see we get ingots of cast casting samples, right? So you basically cast that and you cast a little ingot out of the same pore. And then what we do is you send that to us. Well. Well, it used to be to us, but you send it back to us and we just test it, right? And is it within spec? If it isn't, right, put all them parts on hold. It's just the way it used to go. Oceangate.com to get a little bit more information. And I noticed that their site was taken down on June 22nd. So after the disappearance of the Titan in 2020, don't care. 23, the University of Washington stated that APL, their applied physics laboratory, had no involvement in design, engineering, or testing of the Titan submersible. Yeah, but you see, this, this, it doesn't make a point about this, but this could be two things. This could be, we didn't, right? The bullshitting, or they're attaching their name to us because it gives them some kind of gravitas, right? Or maybe they did. And they're pulling out. They want nothing to do with this. They they don't want to touch this. It's like a shitty stick, right? They just don't want to touch this. We want to distance ourselves as far as we can from it, right? It'd be all of a sudden. It you know, it's like they do with oh, you know, Kevin Spacey does this. Therefore, we absolutely disavow him. We want not. We've cancelled all his projects. We're not. We're not publishing the 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 three D version of American Beauty. You know, or whatever. You know what I mean? It's, it's like the, everyone runs for the hills. So which one is it? We don't know. He's laughing like, oh, we know for a fact that they didn't do any of the testing or had anything to do with it. But do we? And it doesn't matter. Are we going to get what really happened or what? A Boeing spokesperson also said that Boeing was not a partner on the Titan and did not design or build it. A NASA spokesperson said that NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center had a Space Act agreement with OceanGate but did not conduct testing and manufacturing via its workforce or facilities. Basically, all of these partnerships that they had are now being revealed that they were not really partnerships. This is a well, you, you haven't defined what partnership means. So you've just said that and you're just wrong straight away. From your own admission, right? NASA have said that, yes, they had a partnership with them. Exactly what that meant, well, you've got to define that. And they said, look, you know, we rented them this, we rented them facilities and stuff, but we didn't actually do the testing ourselves. So you do have a partnership. It's Why do people do this? <laughs> Classic example of a company trying to get credibility by partnering with NASA. How good does that sound? But they did. NASA have just agreed. And basically all they did was just rent, rent some facilities from some testing. But what exactly they did with NASA isn't really well understood. It probably is, if you look it up. And you seem to look down in a weird way there, like you're making that up. It's a bit strange, is that? But whatever, we, we, I'm still waiting to find out what really happened. It could have just been as simple as, hey, can we run out a little bit of space? That's still a partnership though, isn't it? Right? You still... you. What I mean is, you haven't defined what partnership means. Does it mean that you take shares in the profits and the design? No, I, I don't know. What I'm saying is, you're making out like no one was involved, 
but they are involved in some kind. You haven't defined which one it is, but they are. Over in this corner of your facility. This is probably the most infuriating for me as an engineer. David Lockridge, the Ocean Gate Director of Marine Operations, filed a quality control report in January 2018, stating that no non-destructive testing or NDI of the carbon fiber hull had taken place to check for voids or delaminations in the carbon fiber layup that could compromise the hull strength. And if you see, you don't even have to have, a, this is the whole point, we don't even have to have a compromise. The design could be flawed, flawed and we'll get to that in a minute. NDI non-destructive investigation, NDT non-destructive testing. Right, so NDIs and NDTs are in for this for this kind of environment, for this kind of extreme pressures, is useless. Right, you want to do destructive testing. I want to know what this can take. Right, so you put this cylinder, you cap it off. You basically have the cylinder and the titanium end caps. Right, and you pressure test them and you pressure test them repeatedly. Once a day, you pump it up to pressure, right? And watch what happens. And you do this a thousand times, just say. So then if it doesn't fail in those thousand times, you can say, right, we could use it a hundred times, that kind of thing. I'd more lean towards 10, but you get what I mean. Is a way of checking something to make sure that it's safe without actually breaking it apart. Because But the problem is, is if you look at, if you do an X-ray, of this cylinder right and it's fine that's not telling you anything about what it's like under under stress the really the best way to check if something is safe is to cut it in half break it and go yep it's safe that's that is the shittest explanation that i've ever heard in my life of any kind of exploratory testing testing is a way of checking something to make sure that it's safe without actually breaking it apart. Because the, really the best way to check if something is safe is to cut it in half, break it, and go, yep, it's safe. But of course, you've destroyed the product. So NDT is something that engineers lean on all the time. To no, we kind of don't. No one actually does want to. There's times that you can't help it, right? Um, you've just got to rock and roll with it. It's like uh, a good example is pyrotechnics, right? You can test explosive bolts, but you can't test your explosive bolts. So... When they do stage separation in rockets, right, you can test a batch of charges that you made for that, but you can't test the ones because you have to blow them up to test them. Make sure things are safe. And in the world of carbon fiber, it's that much more difficult because carbon fiber doesn't bend or yield or get grooves and cracks. The oh, what, what, what? Fiber, it's that much more difficult because carbon fiber doesn't bend or yield. It does bend. Or get have you seen a carbon fiber fishing rod <laughs> grooves and cracks the way it does it does no it does it it's just uh, other materials do but it's a different material that'd be like saying do you know what nothing galls like titanium right it's got its own particular property of how it does that the fact of the matter is look they've got honeycombed um carbon fiber skins that they use for apache uh helicopters they use for all sorts of helicopters the carbon fiber is used in military applications. It's used in aviation. It's used in rockets. It's used all over the place. It's how you use it. It's what you use it for, and it's what confidence you have in it. It requires a lot of information and insight. Lockridge was told that OceanGate would rely on the real-time acoustic monitoring system. Which is absolutely insane. Which he felt would not warn the crew of potential failure with sufficient time to safely abort the mission and evacuate. The day after he filed his report, he was summoned to a meeting in which he was told the acrylic window that you look out of was only rated for 1,300 meters because OceanGate would not fund the design of a window rated for 4,000 meters. In that meeting, he... Well, it depends what that rating means. I wish you'd have dug more. When you found out this, I'd like the information. Is that with a factor of safety of eight? Because is everything else rated to that? Because if it's rated to this depth with a factor of safety of eight, right, and the rest of it, like the titanium hemispheres, are rated with a factor of safety of two, then they're, they're completely out of whack. So that doesn't make much sense. Reiterated his... You need, but what I'm saying is you need more information. We need more information than that to then make a decision based on that concerns and added that he would refuse to allow crude testing without a hull scan 
Lockridge was dismissed from his position as a result. Yeah, of course, yes, because they're idiots. Oceangate filed a lawsuit against Lockridge that June, accusing him of improperly sharing proprietary trade secrets and fraudulently manufacturing a reason to get rid of him. This suit was settled in November 2018. I'm sure it was all sealed off and we'll never know exactly what was agreed upon, but that is absolutely terrifying. During a human piloted descent on December 10th, 2018, Stockton Rush used the vertical thrusters to overcome unexpected positive buoyancy when descending past 10,000 feet. These submersibles are like a balloon with air inside, right? So it's hard for them to dive. And so they have different ways and ballast systems to be able to accomplish that. Different ways and ballast systems. Sounds bizarre. Uh, <laughs> again, I'm, I'm questioning this guy's credibility. <laughs> but for whatever reason, around 10,000 feet, he had to use vertical thrusters to continue his descent. And when this happened, it caused interference with the communication systems. Between spinning propellers, the disturbance in the wake of the water coming off those propellers and everything else, they lost contact for one hour. Now, Rush was thrilled to call himself the second person to solo dive to 13,000 feet after James Cameron. But if that was me, I would be terrified. I would come back and figure out what on earth happened with the comms and what can we do. Yeah, but there is this thing called, you know, <laughs> you lose contact. You don't know why. He might have... He might have brought this up and said, why did we lose contact? Can we look into that? Or do we know exactly what he meant by did they completely lose comms? Or could they not hear? Was there a lot of interference and static? What? We don't know. And what the fuck? What has this got to do with what really happened? Can we change the frequency? Can we have a backup system? Can we have a tether? Whatever has to happen to never let that happen again. And we know it happened again because of that r report from the reporter. After these tests were... The report from the reporter? What? You mean the guy who said that the, the, the passenger who was stuck in it, but that was not... Communi they could communicate with them. They just didn't know where they were. Completed. In January 2020, the hull of the Titan began showing signs of cyclical fatigue and the craft was derated to 3,000 meters. Now, this is the most interesting thing I've got in this video. So he's saying that it was suffering from um, cyclic fatigue, right? So basically cycles of having stress placed on something. Showing signs of cyclical fatigue and the craft was derated to 3,000 meters. By who? By them? And what were these signs? Have we got any information on that? That would be really useful. Now, the hull was repaired and again... Re repaired? What do you mean repaired? Can we have any information on this? Rated again for 4,000 meters of diving depth, but by who? And was everything done properly? It's impossible to know. Well, where have you got that information from? And now we're on rockets for some reason. I decided to make this video because I think we're at the precipice of a new age of exotic tourism and ex Oh God, here we go. Because going to the South Pole and going to the North Pole wasn't um, you know, risky. Going up Everest isn't risky. They've always been extreme tourism attractions. People do base jumping, people jump out of planes, people do all sorts. Exploration between going to the space to go to the moon, low Earth orbit, or deep sea diving. We're at the edge of seeing more of this. Wealthier people, the people that were involved in this particular incident, always want to have that next thing. And so if we're going to do this... I wonder what he cut out there. Important to realize just how unsafe this can be. Unlike commercial aviation, there are no regulatory boards involved here. This is international water. The company did have to register the parent vessel that takes people from Canada, right? So that had to be registered. But what happens out in open waters is not very highly regulated. This is a really tough story for me because as an engineer, I do love ambition. I mean, building your own vessel, carbon fiber, five inches thick. It's right, I'm sorry, but everything you just said then is really bizarre. Personally, I find that bizarre. Oh, I'm getting a tech hard on because five inches thick. Here, <laughs> I do love ambition. I mean, building your own vessel is a stupid idea, and anyone who tries to do that, I will laugh at. It requires a lot of expertise in people who have experience in these things. And you, you know, this is the thing you could build one of these in your shed as long as you have an ability to test these things in your shed, as long as you can produce data carbon fiber five inches thick it sounds cool 
You see, you, yeah, I, I, I very much, I, this is bizarre. It really is. But as an engineer, I also realize how important safety measures and protocols. No, that's, that's, as an engineer, that's first and foremost. I don't care how cool it is. That's not, not a consideration. Sorry. Aviation is a perfect example. If you ever hop on an airplane, you cannot imagine how safe you are because of all the people involved. No, you're not. You're at risk on a plane. I don't... <laughs> From company members like... No, I'm, I'm, a lot of people die to get there. This is the thing, right? A lot of people die to get there. The problem is, is that we should be learning our lesson, right? So there's a brand new thing, right? There's this brand new thing. It's called space tourism. But instead of cutting costs, right, you're just going to have to go through the same, you know what I mean? It's like we, we've learned our lesson. We've learned our lesson from the comet. We've learned our lesson from the Titanic. We've learned our lesson from all of these things. So we have to do our due diligence, right? We have to make sure that we do test everything. We don't cut corners. We need to look out for the things that we don't know, right, Before, beforehand. The, the, the Wright brothers just built this thing, got on it, and hope for the best. And then it worked. And then people don't realise that, wow, that was lucky, right? And to be quite honest, you don't go that fast, you don't go that high. Then people started to go towards the sound barrier and died and repeatedly died, right? Even the guy who broke the sound barrier eventually died. And that's the problem, right? You know, if you look at the... Um, all of the X aircraft, the experimental aircraft in American history for breaking the sound barrier and stuff like that, or trying to go Mach 5 and all this rest of it, a lot of people died. And a lot of people died because of stupid reasons, right? Uh, inexperience, stability issues, engine issues, material issues, and all of these things were eventually learned over time. And these things have been learned the hard way. And what we have now is we have all of this stuff documented. So while we're sat here, we should look back and go, hmm, right, now we've gained all of this experience, shared experience as a human race, we should be able to pick this to pieces and say, right, we need to stop this happening in the first place and just test accordingly. <sighs> Boeing and Airbus personnel engineering test officials all the way to the FAA and other regulatory approval bodies that make sure every little thing is regulated and controlled. There is none of that going on. Yeah, but it's, it's not about having regulations and controls. You sound like the absolute polar opposite to the guy who was the CEO of OceanGate. He was like, ah, we need to think out the box, you with your silly little rules and your specifications and testing, you dickheads. That's what he was like. You're completely the other way. We just need people to organise stuff. No, we don't need people to organise stuff. We don't need regulation bodies. What we need is data. We need, we need people to get on... If, like I say, if you could build it in your shed and you could test it and you aren't lying to yourself and you have real data and you've really proved it, what matters is the physics, right? Now, no one might regulate it, but it doesn't matter because I've done all my due, 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 due diligence, due diligence, <laughs> I will get there. And I've done all that. I've done all my testing. I know I'm confident in what I've got. I've done the engineering. I understand it. It's great. I've got the data. I've got the test results. It's going to survive. And I'll do it, and it does. I don't need a, regulator, a regulation body. I don't need specificate. I don't need to pass certain people's specs. I don't need to do that, right? It's not the fact that these specifications and regulations exist. It's what they represent that matters. Here, one of the first things to realize about an implosion of the vessel. Oh, now we're talking. We've got straight away to... Right, okay. Is that there was probably not a lot of suffering. The people probably just died instantly. No, no, they did. They did. They definitely did. We mentioned how much weight you would feel at these depths, and you would pretty much just get crushed. So what probably what happened is they built a vessel. Ah, right. So we are, we are 16 minutes 40 into a 21-minute video, and this is when he's first said, so probably what happened was... Which was in and of itself pretty impressive. The carbon fiber layup, the composite structure, titanium. This was an exotic craft. And it had... What does that mean? A viewing window to go see the Titanic. These are things that human beings could not do before. Well, they could. James Cameron did it 33 times. <laughs> but the problem is every craft, every vessel, every engineering device has an operational lifetime. Now, the way... No, you see, now, you, so basically you're saying... 
And this is the thing. This is one person hearing what another person said, what another person said, what another person said. Or it just it just got knackered over time. But is that true? We don't actually know. Engineers do this. And we're, we're, this is what really happened, not what might have happened. It was by testing something and figuring out how many cycles can we hit this with before problems start to emerge. And then they add a safety factor. For example, your car will work almost forever. There's no pressure involved. It's just atmospheric pressures at sea level. That's not. So the only forces are atmosphere, are external pressures. No, no, no. Your car won't work forever. It wears. And things do fatigue, right? Just generally due to stress, not from literally the atmosphere, the, the conditions around you in terms of pressure. Right? Now, if it rusts and things, that could, that could change the equation. But your car is fine. How about aircraft? Air no, aircraft are fine. But cars are fine. Craft are pressurized and depressurized, pressurized, depressurized, right? But not the, so. Right? And you can't really inspect every little nook and cranny. So what engineers figured out is if we're going to build this out of aluminum, if we're going to build it from carbon fiber, we have to do a test every 1,000 hours, 500 hours, whatever the case is. No, 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 no. What they do is they replace parts, right? So that's rebuild times, rebuild hours, right? So they say, right, we've done the testing on this thing. This thing is going to last. 10,000 hours. Okay, then. So we want to replace it at 5,000 hours. Well short of it. Well short of it. This might be a complete overhaul where they tear down the wall panels and inspect, and they'll actually get out and... No, they don't inspect. They replace. Right? There is inspections involved, right? So if it's obvious, you'd be stupid, right? If there's an obviously a crack in the side of this wing and you miss it, then you deserve to die, right? because you're not respecting the um, environment, you're not respecting what, what you're trying to do. Check for any cracks and other impurities and imperfections. See, what we're talking about is, that we're not talking about, we're probably not talking, we're not talking about cracks. It wouldn't have made it down as far as it was if it had a crack in it. It's because any crack or any little divot can be a stress concentration point. Oh, no, now you're talking rubbish. Where it'll start to impound and fail. Then, in, did you say impound? Concentration point where it'll start to impound and fail. Then, oh. finally, they'll say, at this many hours, 20,000 flat hours, whatever the number might be, the aircraft is retired. That doesn't mean it's going to fall apart, but... Well, no, what that is, <laughs> what it means is this, right? So, turbine blades, they have a 2,000-hour um, operational lifetime. So, time to rebuild is 2,000 hours. After 2,000 hours, that... Turbine blade there has a serial number on it, and at 2,000 hours, it gets junked. They don't care. They actually do send back some back to be tested to maintain this, and, and, and because they do actually change. Uh, they change the times, right? Over, over what you do is, is you say, right, we, we reckon this blade is going to last 2,000 hours. And then they run it for 2,000 hours. You know, aircraft all over the world, and there's hundreds of blades in each engine. So what they do is they take them out, and they test them and go, actually... This actually has done a lot better than we thought. And when you keep on getting more data and more data, and more, it's a feedback system. And then you go, actually, do you know what? We're, we're, we're undercutting these. These are at 50% what we thought they were. So maybe we can not double it, but increase it by 50%. So instead of 2,000 hours, it's now 3,000 hours because things cost money, right? And these blades are performing better than expected. But we're talking about hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of data points over decades and then things start to change, right? So, or maybe it's not doing that well, and it goes the other way. It can go both ways. Um, what did he say? I'm lost. Thousand flat hours, whatever the number might be. So what happens is eventually is that there are things in the aircraft that just can't be changed. The wing spars, the main fuselage. We can't change these parts because they're not interchangeable parts. So what we'd say is we say, that airframe can last 20,000 hours. Once it's done, we do exactly the same thing as we do with the turbine blade. We pull it apart and test it all, but that means the aircraft is done, right? So it's like your car. You can change the brake pads, you can change the wheels, you can change the bonnet, but you can't change the chassis. That would be destroying the vehicle, right? It's exactly the same as that. The aircraft is retired. That doesn't mean it's, it's going to... He's done a lot of things in this video talking about everything else but the submarine. It's going to fall apart, but we know we, we tested it for millions of hours and nothing bad will happen in this window. And that is... That's also not true. It's a prediction that if everything is right, if every if the aircraft is used right, 
if we're right about this material, if no one's lying to us, we predict that hopefully it should last this long. Right? It should. We have nothing to believe that it shouldn't. Then what happens is it breaks and fails. And then on closer inspection, we found micro you know, we found micro fractures in the grain structure due to the casting quenching sequence. You get what I mean, right? It doesn't guarantee anything. The operational window. Odds are a plane could probably fly for thousands more flights after that, but we don't want to do that. That is the operational lifetime. We don't trust it. This is the problem. Your, um, your confidence decreases exponentially after that point. What was the operational lifetime of the Titan? Was it ever established? They were not doing NDIs or NDTs, non-destructive. I don't know if you know they weren't doing that though. Testing to see what was happening to the carbon fiber. Again, carbon fiber is a mesh weave that is laid on mesh in alternating patterns and then glued up. It is it's pretty prog. incredibly strong and incredibly impressive as an engineering material. It's impressive. Who says this? In engineering terms, who says, oh, it's impressive. Steel is impressive. Titanium and carbon fiber and aluminium and mercury and teddy bears and grass. But it's equally not as well studied. We it's not about that. You see, where have you got this from? We have a hundred years of history and experience with high strength steel. High strength steel. Just saying that sounds stupid. Uh, don't you think Formula One and the aviation industry have a lot, and the space industry have a lot of um, data regarding carbon fiber? No? No? People make carbon fiber wheels? No? No? Aluminum and other materials. Other companies that literally specialize in carbon fiber? No? But this is a new frontier. And it's weird that they said that the Titan cylinder was manufactured by a composite material, a composite company. Why isn't anyone asking them questions? That's why this is so important to cover. New frontiers are exciting. They're sexy. They're glamorous, right? Air travel. We're on the brink. Did he just say sexy? <laughs> of space tourism. Where How we can fix this. So he hasn't told us all. Rich people can buy a ticket to go up and tour around the moon, have a nice little catered lunch and come home. Whenever we have new frontiers, we have unknowns. That's what makes it a frontier. There's not a playbook. And when you have to build vessels able to withstand the pressures of the ocean's deep, deep waters, there's a lot of that is unknown and that's why we don't have commercial no there's not this lot that's unknown what you talked about we know the pressure versions of this i think this vessel just had some sort of a crumple or some defect or deformation something was happening over a couple of cycles i mean they did successfully go down and come back three or you know three times and that fourth time they crumpled i didn't actually know how many times it was honestly i don't think any vessel that goes to the mariana trench or 12,000 feet in the Atlantic should have a life more than a couple of cycles. You see, what, you're just guessing? It's not how engineering works. And you should know this as an engineer. I'm doing the inverted commas thing. And I think what they were trying to do, I think Stockton Rush was trying to make these tickets affordable, right? Now, they started... What he was doing is trying to make money, and he was full of himself. Started at $125,000, doubled that by the time these guys went on at two fifty. dollars Right, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars sounds like a ton of money. The real it is a ton of money. All in four people and four passengers on that sub is a million quid. You do this in one day, minus your overheads, that's half a million quid profit. It's amazing in a day. If you could do this once a week, half a million pound every every week or every other week, that's amazing. The price for this probably should have been a million dollars, one point five. Just plucking numbers out your ass. That allows you to replace the vessel every so often or to do complete disruptive testing to replace parts. There is a whole slew of things that have to happen. Oh, you just make them spheres. But I think in the interest of trying to be affordable, being on the ship yourself, the prestige. He's trying to cut corners. That's what he was doing. If he makes a cheap thing, he makes a cheap thing. Prestige of your reputation, trying to build a brand, trying to build a company. They took all kinds of shortcuts and did things they do not understand. And I'll be honest with you, we know more about space than we do our deep oceans or the deep earth. That's got nothing to do with anything. We've got more, we know more about space because there's more of it. We know more about space because we can see it, right? We don't need to, <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. The other thing as well is there's not much in the deep oceans. I can tell you that, right? There's a, there's, there's probably, there's probably about maybe 10,000, I'm, I'm guessing here, but there's probably about 10,000 species of other things we haven't seen. 
Maybe even a million. Who knows, right? But apart from that, that's it. There's a lot of topography. There's some shipwrecks. That's it. These are just really, really hard environments to get to. This is tra yeah, that's true. Magic, you know, I was an optimist. I was hoping that we would find them somewhere. and Which is also strange, right? Because as soon as I heard this story whatsoever, I was like, they're dead. That this would all be kind of be a, a learning lesson without loss of life. It didn't work out that way. But in engineering, we have to always learn from our mistakes. If you're a believer in freedom and, you know, these people took the risk, they knew what they were doing. I do agree with that. I'm, I'm a believer of freedom and taking your own risk or taking your own. Yeah, that's true. Right. So we'll, we'll sort that video off. Let's talk about. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Let's see if I can do this quickly. Right. So let's talk about what the actual problems were. So this craft was uh, a cylinder of carbon fiber with these end caps glued on so let's actually go to solidworks and let's have a look at our craft so what you are relying upon right is or what the problems are with this system is that the shape um kind of encourages a specific uh, deformation right so if we just go to this now like this if you have a sphere ooh, if you have a sphere like this and you apply pressure to this sphere in every single direction it's not because of the column of water above your head but if you apply pressure to this in every single direction I'm just going to do a couple of these I'm not going to do every single direction What's happening is, is that, oh, the deal. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Going mental. If you do this, right, what's happening is, is that all of the pressure is centred. Oh, my God. Where's a star? The pressure is centred in the middle, right, like this. Which means that for all of these arrows... Um, there is an equal pressure forcing the other way. Right, so we'll do a, a, a reactionary force in a sense. So this pressure here, through the structure, is counteracting this force applied. So we hopefully are in equilibrium as long as the material is stiff enough. If the material is stiff enough and doesn't flex, we're all good. <coughs> so... This pressure, if it, a million psi, two psi, doesn't matter, as long, you know, it's equal through the other side. Now, what what this is all reliant on is this is all reliant on the structure being able to transfer the force from one side to the other. So, if you have a skin like this, as long as the material can transfer the forces, right? So what we have is we have this has to be transferred to there, but through the body. Oops. Through the body like this. If this can do this without this deforming, right, to any great degree, then great. It's got to transfer, and it's transferring around it. So it's transferring around this way as well. Yeah, if we just pick a vector, if we just pick this bottom one, like that, right? The force has been transferred and counteracting this force, and same vice versa. And obviously, it's like an orange, you know, with segments. Kind of, it's got its three dimensions. It's going all the way around this thing. And if it is equal, right, then you can take quite a lot of pressure. And all you have to really work out is the stiffness of this material, right? How much this is going to try and deform. The thing is, it's been pressed in every single direction. So what you then need to worry about is can all of these atoms in here hold themselves together in this shape against this exterior force? Because the internal force pushing out is basically non-existent. The pressure's out here, 380 atmospheres versus 1, 380 to 1, it might, that 1 might as well not really exist, right? It, it, it's, it's not much at all. And it's air, it's compressible versus the almost incompressible fluid on the outside so this is what matters if you have this structure now the problem is is that if you change that um 
you know, if you change the material, uh, the shape, sorry, the form, which is what a lot of people don't seem to want to discuss or don't discuss. If you change this shape, and unfortunately we don't have an egg, so I'm going to have to, uh, not an egg, a cylinder, so I'm going to have to make my own. Uh, if you, ch oh, for God's sake, do you know what I've done is I've done this on the wrong thing. So if we get this, like this, and we change this, actually, we don't even have to do, I'm just trying to make a point, so we can do this. If we do this, then what happens is, is that you have introduced a weaker region because a lot of this is going down like this and these are far apart so this is more likely to crumple so we'll get rid of that arrow on the end like this this is more likely to do this it's more likely to deform like this all right and if it deforms like this you have a really high stress here on the corners and weirdly enough that's where our seals are. Our seals are here. Now, they've made a cylinder, not a, an oval like this. And actually, an oval would probably be stronger than an actual cylinder. right? But you've got your seals here for these end caps. So, it's all right just saying that in principle. Does that actually look like anything? right? So, on SolidWorks, as you can see, I just want to show you that again, actually. As you can see... This is not just to look pretty. I've just made the outside skin white. This is actually in SolidWorks defined as carbon fiber, right? And these are titanium rings. I've just made this a different color of titanium just so you can see where each component is. We've got our acrylic jobby there, right? Which is in a wedge because it's been pushed in. It's got a bolting ring that bolts it there. I haven't done all the holes for all the bolts. I don't need to really for this. So we have got our hemispheres, right? And when we go to testing, like this, so I can show you, when we apply the stress, so let's, we, we're applying pressure to absolutely everything. We'll just hide that so we can see it. Look what happens. So this is our stress that's applied. The hemispheres seem to be completely fine. Even around this fillet, around this ring here, it seems to be fine. Now nothing's yielding, but look what's happening at these rings. So what's happening is, is that the titanium is, the, the, the cam fibre is deforming. You can see it there, right? I forgot the displacement. So the brighter the red colour, right, the more the deformation, the more something's moving, it's changing shape. If I click on this, you should be able to see, if I click on the side view like this, and we click on, is it going to show us the hole there? So this is exaggerated, but you can see how it's solid there. The titanium rings are keeping it in shape, but this is buckling. It's been squashed inwards. All right? It's been squashed inwards, kind of due to the material, but it's because it's this long cylinder with open ends that are glued. All right? Now, if we actually look at this is exaggerated, we're talking about seven millimeters of deflection so it's red it's dented in seven millimeters now are you really going to notice this no probably not you are not going to be sat in there noticing that this has moved seven millimeters now this is due to solid works right it could be less but it is moving compared to the rest of it now you might say why is this end cap moving like this well it's because because this is shrinking this is moving in all right this is you know it's moving that way it's not collapsing it's moving towards the center towards where my mouse is there uh, it's literally just moving full stop it's because i've defined it from this end right so because we've defined it from this end this isn't moving and this is so if we put this cap onto this ring it probably won't move nowhere near as much and this is only moving in about three three millimeters something like that right so because this has been squashed it's pulling this in but what will happen is, is that you'll actually try and pull this out of its socket. It's glued in there, and that's what could be possibly a fatigue. Now, this thing could split and crack and implode and all the rest of it. But I think the problem is actually this interface. Now, these are all guesses and all the rest of it, right? 
but this once it once it fails um it just bang right it just it just shrinks now this deformation here could cause it to collapse split crack you know the inside would be under some severe compression uh, and I don't mean from outside, I mean literally how the, the material is deforming. Now, one thing that other people have been talking about um, is they found the caps, right? So they found the, both caps and they found, someone was talking about the uh, glass missing. So we'll talk about that in a second. But what I want to say is um, that I believe, I don't know what really happened because we need the data for it. We need, you know, some kind of uh, investigation and that will come out soon. I reckon it was actually the bonding. So my prediction is is it's how you have bonded this to this. Instead of having some tension bars, so having lugs on here, and then having bars, tension bars, that keep this uh, locked together. Um, so even if this does try to delaminate like that, or come away with the glue, actually, how would you even do that? It would be best to bond this to a skin. Yeah, actually, it's a very good question how you'd even do that. You wouldn't do it, you'd just make cylinders, but uh, uh, hemispheres, circles, spheres. But any road, what I want to talk about is the um, people have a lot of speculation about this end cap coming off, or maybe the, the, the acrylic blew up, maybe that died. As you can see here, um, I've literally called this, this is literally glass, this is uh, acrylic, it's plastic. It's uh, I put polycarbonate in. But uh, not acrylic, but polycarbonate. But that actually seems fine. It's, it's this is all under the same pressures, right? Because it's a wedge shape. If we go back to the model, you can see that it's a wedge shape. And what happens is, is that it's literally forced into this hole. So it's not. It's direct. You're just trying to force something into a bigger hole. And because this is, you know, there's so much material here, you're all good and fine, right? So this, this is, this is all good and gravy. Um, but it's missing. And you say, well, if the pressure's so much, blah, 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 why is this missing? Surely people believe that this has been the failure, or some people, I've seen people say that this is the failure, because it's missing. So, you've got your gadgets in here, right? And let's just say that here's a seal. I know this isn't the right drawing, but whatever. And then let's just say there's a seal there, right? You like this. And let's just say this fails, Right, so what happens is, is this is full of air, and let's just say this tube collapses. What happens is, is that all of this falls in. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm doing lines. Why am I doing lines? Give me a paintbrush. All of this falls in, so it collapses in, bang like that, and the air has to go somewhere. And some people might think, oh, so this bubble of compressed air, you know, there'll be a it's getting squashed into here, it's getting squashed into here. Does that pop it off? No, right? Because even though there's this squished air, there's pressure out here pushing the lens back in. You know what I mean? So the pressure out here is 380 atmospheres, the pressure of this air is 380 atmospheres. So that's not what would happen. What is more likely to happen, and it's what people usually don't think about, is shock waves. Right, pressure waves and shock waves. So this collapses, and then you get, you know, in a sense, shock waves that come in like this, and then they collide, and then they'll bound, rebound outwards like this. And it's probably the energy that are in those shock waves, basically acoustic waves. It's probably what they heard, right? They have these acoustic waves that bounce out. This one just goes poop and pops off that cap. This one goes poop and pops off that cap and it pops off the cap or the acrylic well the acrylic dome is literally it's like a, a it's like a, a you know a cork it just goes pops clean out forget the bolts they don't care right and they'll probably find that the bolt holes on that ring so the, there's some fasteners here there's some bolt holes on this ring they'll probably find that all of these threads are completely stripped out right they've just been popped out they've just been pushed out because of this shock wave it's a hell of a lot of energy that if you look it's concentrated that's why this is a bad example it's funneled in right this hemisphere basically concentrates this shock wave so all of the energy that's in this big wave gets concentrated down to a small wave so all the energy basically you know it gets funneled in and pop 
that pops off the cap pops off and if we look at photos i haven't got any up but if we look at photos of what's left is it looks like the back end is uh it looks like it's taken an impact a shove from the back and i think this cap has banged into all the gubbins that's here it's fired into the back of it dented it up a bit but that's it right and this this will be dust i imagine if they do find any of it they'll either find this carbon fiber tube split in two like perfect they're not perfectly but you get what i mean like two halves of a shell that's all crump crumpled and stuff or one half maybe but i don't believe that i reckon this basically just turned to dust it ex it, it almost exploded right so it's internally but it basically just exploded out that little pocket of air would have pissed off again it's the shock wave, I think. I think the shock wave that travelled through this, um, through the air, it's you know, it, it it'd be one hell of a shock, a pressure wave, like an explosion. It literally is an explosion, and um, it would have popped this out, like I say, like a cork, just fire off you go. They probably will never find. Well, actually, one day someone will probably go down in another submersible, find that, and then the next time they go down, it'll implode and everyone dies again, and we keep on not learning our lessons. But uh, hopefully they do find the acrylic. It's probably just one piece. It's probably fine. It's probably just got fired out. Um, but yes, the major thing with this is that uh, it could be fatigue. That's a, a very good. That's a very good point. It could be a fatigue. But I reckon it's more to do with the behaviour. Um, it's more to do with the behaviour of the actual design. So in a sense, this was inherently a bad idea. Right, it's inherently a bad idea. Um, as soon as you start to deform this like this, we're not anywhere near yield, right? When we go to the stress, we're not near the yield of any of these things. SolidWorks is saying basically that this lip is bending, right? This titanium lip here is bending. Now that's down to the model, right? That's down to the constraints of the model. This is suppose that this titanium bit is attached to this carbon bit. What would happen in reality is that this carbon, this titanium bit, would actually stay still, and it would be the glue that delam, you know, it basically peels off. It just delaminates. The glue that's gluing the two together just peels off. And if you look at that video, we have, it's not much. It needs to be. The component is, it's the glue. Of actually, we watched the whole thing. One other thing I will add as well is what happens to this glue over time? Someone did mention salt water. I don't think really that would be too much of a problem. It could be, could be. Um, but I reckon it's more to do with also what happens to this glue over time. Does it age? Does it start? Does it, you know, does it become brittle? What happens to it? Because it could be that, you see. It could be the fact that the carbon fibre tube is flexing in and then back out when it comes back to the surface. In and out, in and out, in and out. And that flexing could actually crack the glue today is a critical uh, joining you know what i mean and then that one time that you go down and this flexes and that just delaminates boom that's it see you later that's just it too late and it, it, it might they might even find this is the thing imagine if they found the cylinder complete that is literally it just literally tore itself apart Right? It literally just bent to the point where it just popped open. There would The amount of energy and stuff due to the pressure would probably cause it to explode. But if we look at the titanium bits, they're completely fine. So you never know. Um, but yeah, back to the video. ...of the titanium and the carbon fiber. There seems to be no... Cool. This seems to be a smooth surface. There's no kind of keying or locking or anything. It's not even like it's bolted down in any way. You could have put inserts in this something now how much that changes the you know the integrity of the carbon fiber what i don't understand is they literally get a ring and glue it i don't know why they weren't bonded together you could literally make a mesh surface on you could have a mesh surface in the titanium so they basically become more like one material the joining of the titanium and the carbon fiber that seal needs to be uniform and small but not too small level, do a good cleaning, check the surface out, and he will check measurements. 
between the two components, um, really what's holding them together and allowing them to move together is the glue. And so you want nice, even uh, movement. It's the glue holding the family together and we want to make sure it's right. I think that is, or it will probably turn out to be like the um, famous last words, if you want to put it that way. And it's pretty simple, but if we mess it up, there's not a lot of recovery. When you say recovery, I think he's talking about if we mess this up, these parts are junk. I'd be more like, if you mess this up, people die. But weirdly enough, it, he's saying this after the fact. You can see it's actually stuck on top. Look. So what they were using there, they were using a comparator. Together is the glue, and so you want nice. Oh, even... you see this bit. There's not a lot of recovery. So there, they've got a flat edge, a straight edge on the top. They've probably got it sat on a flat edge on the bottom, and they're using this, which is basically like almost like a long a micrometer in a sense, an internal micrometer. It's just a pole with a screw in it, and then basically you set this to one side, you do it the other side, and you compare them to make sure that they both ends are parallel. The glue is very thick, so it's not like Elmer's glue, it's like uh, peanut butter. So basically, they are just applying this by hand. Just, just, yeah, be right, be right. Just apply it by hand. I can't see anything that could possibly go wrong with that. Like consistency, evenness, all that kind of jazz. And then they're literally just pasting it on with trowels from Home Depot. You figure anything over 30? And I've noticed as well, which I haven't got in my model, peanut butter. That there's this looks like it's flat, like that. But on the outside, it looks like there's a little rim, a lip. There, you can see it there where his elbow is. You can see there's this machined lip. It's either machined or it's just part of the structure. Again, could be a point of weakness. Fantastic job, lads. It's almost like Tiger Seal. <laughs> this is the point of no return right here. And I think the tape, the blue tape there, is if they get any glue on the titanium ring, they can just peel the tape off. Get a nice clean edge. South and east to west. See, look, there's the straight edge. So you can tell that they were making the measurements after they put the ring on. That's what they were doing. Oh, yeah, so that will be the pressure vessel for Cyclops 2. It'll go to 4,000 meters. Now, that seems to fit awfully well. Like, I, there doesn't seem to be much squeezing <laughs> out or mushy. I'd expect diving. to get a good seal. Carbon fiber sub ever built. When it goes to 4,000 meters, it'll be the only one out there. I'm going to be the first. It is the only one down there. This guy in the sub, so we will see. Yeah, that's one hell of a lip you can see on the inside. 4,000 meters will be the only one out there. I'm going to be the first guy in the sub. Right, so, so I think these are the problems. I think the integration between the carbon fiber tube and the rings, they do not allow for any... Um, flex i don't think i don't think they allow for enough flex i don't think they uh there's no like almost like an expansion joint in a sense as things change shape and move and jostle and as things deform due to external pressures just say like this there is no leeway in all of this to allow that to happen it it's a glue and let's just hope it holds any road that's my take on that people were asking for this video uh, I thought doing it against someone else's opinions with 13 million views, you know, he can't be wrong, can he? I think that was a terrible video. I think that was, we'll give that a thumbs down for all that it helps. Um, I think that was a terrible video. I think you really didn't say anything or give any kind of uh, description. Actually, bad descriptions of things. Any road, hope that makes sense. I know this has been a long one. If you got to the end, get a life. Hope that makes sense, and I'll see you in a bit.